What about that next time? <coughs> See how far we get this time. What will it be like? It'll be like the midterm. So I'm going to do a special review for it, because as a matter of fact, I feel we're reviewing all the way through here. So uh, what would you, uh, you can bring your note cards on little four by sixes or five by eights or three by fours, whatever you feel you can need. You can bring your New Testaments. Bring Josephus if you want. No textbooks. And uh, I'll give you two out of three essays out of some of the things we've been talking about. I haven't even figured it out myself yet, so it would be absurd for me to tell you what's on it since I haven't, I wait for the Holy Ghost to take hold. <laughs> and then I, 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 uh, I let the Holy Ghost dictate it to me. <clears throat> or uh, in the Koran, the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel is, uh, it's sometimes called the Holy Ghost, sometimes the Angel Gabriel. Come on, get me started here. Where, where chapter we leave off on here? John. We were in the uh, interview with uh, Pilate, yeah. where the Jews say, His blood be on us and our descendants in perpetuity. Oh, for a, what a very convenient theological uh, uh, <laughs> position to announce. Huh? What page is it? Now, what's the actual reference? John, 18, 28 to 38. Of what is it? You were beginning the trial. No, I finished the trial. Well, well, anyway, give, give me the number what, that you think I'm on. Matthew what? 26. Uh, okay. 26, okay, okay. Right. Peter's outside warming himself at the, at the, uh, let's see, okay, so we have people coming out with swords, some of Jesus' followers being armed, something the, a lot of scholars have made a lot of, but you see, the problem is that the scholars who make a lot of these small points normally are accepting the general thrust of this as having some histor historicity about it. That's the question we have to deal with in this class. I can't be the final judge of that. But to rescue small portions of it and say, this may be not right, or this is curious, or, or whatever, I mean, you have to decide about the whole the, uh, the whole picture uh, and so on. So these are situations that I'm not able to draw a final conclusion. Only you are. But as I said, even the scholars who are trying to, let's say, who raise questions about why would his followers be armed and so on and so forth, um, generally are operating within the total framework of the of this narrative here, for better or for worse. So you have to be the judge of. Um, where you draw the lines, if you draw any lines, you may not want to draw any lines. You may feel the whole thing is um, totally, um, totally um, accurate the way it's presented. So, and then you don't have a problem looking for the historical Jesus. We've repeated over and over again. Okay, now um, let's see. Uh, John has an additional speech. John 18. About one man died for the people. And another disciple followed Jesus, line 1815, who was known to the high priest. Again, this curious other disciple. We have a curious person mentioned in Luke's resurrection scene on the road to Emmaus. Uh, Clopas and another. Which other? How was he known to the high priest? All these very curious uh, innuendos that I can't, uh, I can't uh, sort out for you. But people say this other one is, uh, I think, John, or was it, is it Judas Iscariot? I'm not sure who this other one here at this point is supposed to be. Um, the high priest uh, questions Jesus in 19. I ever taught in your synagogues and temples where the, all the Jews came together again. Uh, um, what's this, a non-Jew speaking? Um, hello, um, head of the Supreme Court, Judge, um, who's the head of the Supreme Court at the moment? Roberts. Judge Roberts. I always claim among your people where all the Americans were. Well, come on. <laughs> An American wouldn't say, I always came among your people where all the Americans were gathered. <coughs> I mean, I'm sorry to uh, point these matters out, but John and a lot of the others reveal themselves to be 
writing as if Jesus is a foreigner, as a Greek, or, or, or one of us, one of the people who actually is writing this. Again, you have to make your decision if you think that matters or not. I, I'm just pointing that out as a problem. You decide, again, if, and if you want to write about this, you can discuss, is this a problem, isn't this a problem, are these things problems, aren't they problems? This is what I would waste my time writing about in an essay. Okay, and as he spoke this, an officer stood by, struck him. This is the way you talk to the high priest? Um, so there's an intervening interview with this Anans. Now, again, I don't know how that uh, jives with the synoptics. I don't remember. Was there an intervening interview with with Ananus in the in the synoptics? I don't think so. So that's another. So well, that's just value added. We're getting more information here. Others will say it's another discrepancy. What should you do? You should discuss these things. There's no final. There's no, you don't have to worry about being wrong. There is no final. You know, no one has the truth about this. No one was there. No one has a truth. <coughs> All you have to do is show intelligence and perception, that's all, and uh, do your best. That's, that's how I would do it, if I were And I would uh, try, to, uh, try to explain what that means to me, these sorts of issues between John and the synoptics. Why is he sent um, bound first to Ananus? What, Ananus has, uh, has soldiers uh, around him, striking people in the mouth and this kind of thing? Personally, I don't credit that at all. I just don't credit these presentations, frankly. But it doesn't matter. The point is, who is Ananus? He's not high priest. What later happens to Ananus? If he was involved in this execution, which he may well have been. We spoke about Ananus. First of all, what's the name of his son? And who is he involved in the death of? And what does Josephus say about that which is in Josephus, not like this here? He says that the people who most cared about righteousness and, and equity were very upset about what Ananus did, trumping up a um, um, blasphemy charge against James in 62 AD. This is in Josephus' Antiquities. I don't think many people uh, um, cavil about the historicity of that. It doesn't look like it's an interpolation. It may be, but it doesn't look like it is. And it calls James the brother of somebody. It's not clear exactly. Uh, he says the miracle worker we mentioned previously, or something to that effect. Um, and um, the problem is he didn't mention him as such previously, or whatever. I don't remember there. There's some issues as far as the identification of that James or Jacob in Hebrew, Jacobus in Greek, in Josephus. But Ananus, as it turns out, has a, a brother. What's the brother's name? Jonathan. What happened to him? He was assassinated. At the moment in Josephus, where <coughs> Josephus introduced us, is us to the party of the extreme zealots called Sicari. It's at that point that he tells us who the Sicari are. I say... And you say, oh, well, you're always making excuses, Eisenman. Yeah, well, it may be. But I say that you ought to look at people by mutual enemies, who their enemies were. Uh, if people have the same enemies, they may be, in fact, on the same orientation or uh, part of a network of different groups, more or less violent, with the same anti-establishment, revolutionary, if you like, orientation. And I think it works in this case. Um, in my work on the Dead Sea Scrolls, I certainly identify Ananus, Ben Ananus, as looking very much like the wicked priest. And I give a lot of arguments for uh, allusions in the Dead Sea Scrolls that um, link up with Ananus' uh, story, fate, activities. For instance, the scrolls talk about violating his corpse speaks about the um, violent ones of the Gentiles who seem to be in uh, collusion 
with the um, scroll Essenes, if you want to call them that. And um, we know from Josephus that the Idumeans are led into the temple. And these can be called the bottom ones of the Gentiles. They're very violent. In the middle of the uprising in 68 AD, and they go through the city and they kill all the high priests. Now, why are the Idumeans and the Zealots killing all the high priests? Please tell me. Please give me an answer to that. Because they could look upon them as collaborators, as, as pro-Roman quizlings, stoolies, whatever you want to call them. <coughs> totally illegitimate and totally hated. And the one they want most of all is, guess who? Ananas Ben Ananas. And Josephus laments his faith in such terms that one is sure that he's not sincere. Because he says the same thing about Ananus, but Ananus says most texts say about James, that he was the protector of his countrymen, that the city fell because of his death, and so on. And most early church say, texts say that about James. So there's a lot of play back and forth in words. Very subtle, I mean, it's so sophisticated and so complicated that the average person who just comes at this from a lay point of view or a beginning point of view couldn't possibly hope to to go through the, the maze, the minefield of these things. I mean, it, I, I've been looking at it for 30 years. I think I'm barely getting on top of it now. And most scholars look at it all their lives, and I don't think they ever get on top of it a lot of them. So how's the average person going to do it? Well, that's the whole point. It's very difficult. I think that's why it's been so successful in terms of um, not being um, countered in any way. But now with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we really do have the native messianic material at our fingertips that can help us then. Now, these Sicarii or Zealots who assassinate Jonathan, I see a sequentiality there. Um, the assassination of Jonathan, the trumped up trial to destroy James, who's seen as responsible for the assassination of, of, um, <coughs> of um, Jonathan. The Zealot Sicari taking vengeance, uh, uh, as far as the Dead Sea Scrolls actually say, they took vengeance for the righteous teacher, what he did to the righteous teacher, this wicked priest. Uh, the Sicari, that's why you have to always read a lot of this in tandem with Josephus, which is why I gave you Josephus at the beginning of the class. Not that I love to see, as you know. Um, they take vengeance for the destruction of James in this violent way. Why else would they be so violent? And they also throw his body. First they abuse it, as I, we said last time, and then they throw his body outside the walls as naked as food for jackals and dogs. You couldn't do a higher insult. What are they so upset about? That's all I ask. What are they so upset about? I can only think of the death of James. So I'm saying that people with similar enemies should be on similar sides. So they may not have exactly the same attitude towards violence. I mean, um, you can have um, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. They're more or less on the same side, but one <laughs> wants uh, peaceful resistance, the other wants to push it further, or the Black Panthers, if you prefer, you follow me? So, I mean, th th this is not surprising that people on the same order, but they're all anti the present situation. So, people on the same side <coughs> often disagree as to means. So, whatever the picture here is, this doesn't prove anything. This doesn't prove the Jews were involved in the death of Christ one iota, which is what it's trying to point towards, his death blood be upon us and upon our people. What? The Jews are responsible for priests that they didn't put in, that were forced on them by brutal dictators. Are we holding the people of Romania responsible for what Ceausescu did, who was put in power by the Russians? You follow me? Yet that's how the world has taken this forever, and that's how all Muslims then have taken the same propaganda, and it permeates the Koran and so on. That's because slogans are much easier to deal with than the complexity of real history. 
it's so easy to get a slogan, and once you got the slogan, you're dead. You know, you can't fight that slogan. Because people live, die, they take their whole lives trying to find out about this, then they pass away, then new people come in, don't know anything about it, the slogan starts working all over again. I don't have an answer to that. I'm just your university students, and you want to learn. So that's the only thing I can tell you. So what is it? so 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 so? And the, given the movie, the passion, which is you know exaggerated from this, like a, a, a tenfold or a, a hundredfold. Uh, what's the point of it? You see, what what's it pointing at? So these are not legitimate representatives of the Jewish people. They are not popular. They are not put in, they are put in by the powerlessness of the Jewish people, not because of the Jewish people want these people. And when the Jews get a chance to kill them, they kill them all. So, I mean, you know, what's being said here, as far as things like that go? Well, that would be very difficult to explain to the average person in a, you know, faith or a barroom situation. You, know, you would never be able to explain that. But anyway, I give it to you to make of it what you will. So, uh, after this horrible treatment by Caiaphas, which uh, I'm sure Caiaphas was not a uh, uh, pleasant chap, whatever we want to say about him in the end, then we have the issue of Peter in the courtroom here, and we have um, 57. They were led to the house of Caiaphas the high priest. So, it's, in, it's not in a normal place of sitting. Whatever this seeming Sanhedrin may have been, it's not in a normal place of sitting. And I, I make a lot of that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, uh, Scrolls. It says that um, the wicked priest pursued the righteous teacher in his hot anger with or in his place of exile. Well, a normal that say, oh, uh, the wicked priest came to Qumran where the righteous teacher was exiled and therefore, um, I don't say that this relates to this particular passage here, I'm trying to say that there is a parallel here, uh, and therefore um, upset him on Yom Kippur or something like that. I say that is long chapters in my New Testament because that's not the way it is. The Talmud in several sections in the Sanhedrin chapter, Sanhedrin is the proceedings of the Sanhedrin, says that for 40 years from a certain time until the fall of the temple, the Sanhedrin was exiled, and actually uses the word exile, from its normal place of sitting in the great stone chamber to a house or location outside of the temple precinct. Therefore, all decisions made at that time were illegitimate. That's what the Talmud says. And it says it around ten different places. Funnily enough, the great stone chamber is something to do with... Um, oh, it was exiled to Beit Hanut. That's where it was exiled, to the house of something Hanut. And here you have Hamato. Hamato, okay, it's not exactly the same, but you have these kind of characteristics in the scrolls. Hamato means his anger. I've tried to show there's some play on words in some of these things. In any case, it's too complicated for me to uh, describe all that. I have it online in um, some of the things mentioned in that book. You can see the article I wrote about that, transmuting words. But I also have it in, a, in, in, in a one or two long chapters in that book, and you can make of it what you will. I don't hold you responsible for it. In any case, that's very interesting that it was not, whatever happened was not a normal, well, it was not a normal Sanhedrin meeting. And for sure, if this is Passover time, I assure you that they would not be getting together in, in the evening of Passover to deal with a minor issue of this kind. So, I mean, this is, again, Jesus says things, I will destroy the temple in three days and rise it up. Okay, he's kind of like bragging or whatever it is here. And I will bring another that is not made by hands. And then the high priest gets angry about that. I don't know why the high priest would get angry about that. Then he asks him something, are you the Christ, the Son of God? Well, we did this before. 
Uh, first place, uh, maybe it's a translation, but the high priest wouldn't even know who the Christ was. Wouldn't even think he was the Son of God. So again, this is after the Christian theology of the Christ, the Son of God, has come into place. I don't know when or where that is, but uh, you say, why wouldn't he? Well, because, the, because the Messiah, if that's what we're talking about, um, wasn't supposed to be the Son of God in any way that I'm aware of in any text from, the, from uh, that period or biblical prophecy. Then again, and then we have the coming on the clouds of heaven, sitting on the right hand, rending his pre uh, his his uh, clothes, and he's guilty. Even in this exchange, I don't see anything that uh, would make him guilty of anything, particularly just raving, maybe. Forget that. Let's move on. Peter is outside denying the master three times before the cock crows from 69 Matthew. Um, so, you were with Jesus the Galilean. That's interesting. Galilean is normally a word used for zealots. Um, Judas the Galilean is the founder of the, uh, of the uh, zealot movement. You say, well, it could mean he comes from Galilee. Yeah, it could mean he comes from Galilee, but normally it's... Um, used to, to talk about the, the movement started by Judas the Galilean. Um, you were with the Nazarene, or Nazarene, Mark adds, line 67 in Mark. Um, repeated in line 71 of, of Matthew. And these are names for this movement. Um, again, I don't know if the woman in the courtyard will use it, but again, that's something you'll have to think about. More about his being a Galilean, line 59 of Luke, line 70 of Mark, and um, here um, John comes in according to this one. One of the servants of the high priest, John 26, 1826, says, <coughs> being kinsman of him whose ear Peter cut off. A lot of personal detail here. Um, so he knows Peter cut his ear off, his kinsman. Again, not, not sure that would be something they would know about, but that's something you'll have to decide on. Again, it has to do with how you take this risk. I can't judge it. Uh, Luke 69, the same, so you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and then they all said, you are the Son of God. I don't know what to make of these things about the Son of God. I know about the Son of Man. Maybe it's the primal Adam, but other than that, I don't know what to make about the Son of Man being the Son of God. All these things uh, you'll have to uh, worry over. Then Judas, 20, I'm trying to get to the resurrection scene, that's I'm hurrying here. These are familiar passages. Then Judas would betray him, or deliver him up, Matthew, went to uh, get the 30 pieces of silver. Earlier in, I think it was um, John, when they argued with uh, Mary anointing Jesus' feet and washing them with her hair and so on. Why do you have this ointment, Judas said, it should be sold for 300 pieces of silver. Say, so what's that prove? Now they like to do that in this prayer, put tens in, take tens away, 300, 3,000, they have up to 3 million. But um, I'm not sure that these are totally unrelated. Anyway, he casts the silver into the temple. This is very complex here. Uh, into the treasury, since it is the price of blood. And um, they bought a potter's field to bury strangers in. This is the field of blood. But the main point is, 
this thus was fulfilled the words that were spoken by the prophet Jeremiah which are totally misquoted anyway but it wasn't the prophet Jeremiah that wrote anything like that if you want to find it it's something like that in the prophet Zechariah I don't have time to go and read you the, the, the related quote from the prophet Zechariah but there's a lot going on here. I cover this great detail in my book that's too complicated without a lot of sources and playing around with the words and so on to do much with except to point out, if I might, that here Judas Iscariot hangs himself, right? Is that right? Um, let's go look at Acts. I think it's an act. It's hard to be so, so mean. This is what lawyers would do in a courtroom with testimony, and vice versa. So where's the defense attorney? We got it here. Let's, let, let, let's just come on in here then. Let's see if we can find where Judas... 118. Huh? 118. Yeah. Similar passage. So, uh, I guess it's Peter speaking, 15. And he stood up in the midst of the disciples. And there were about 120. And Peter said, Men, brothers, we have to fulfill scripture. What came out of David's mouth? As to Judas, what came out of David's mouth according to these, um, this orientation? The Psalms. The Psalms are attributed <coughs> to David, even in the Koran. They're called David's book. As to Judas, for he was counted with us and was given. Now, this, these are these are quite uh, incredible sections, and uh, I'd have to have a whole thing here to go and look at the Psalms in question. They bought a field for unrighteousness, and he fell face down. He broke in, uh, up in the middle of it, and all his bowels gushed out. That's the picture of Judas Iscariot's death in Acts. Okay? So there's a problem. So he said, oh, well, you know, he died, didn't he? I don't know. I have to read the Gospel of Judas Iscariot, see what they think there. But the point is, we've got two different versions here. A lot of material about the field of blood again. So there's another attempt to um, deal with this issue. I'll have to skip it. And uh, let his home be forsaken, and let there be another one in it, and let another take his office. If you look at the Greek, which is why it's so important, the office, which is supposed to now be filled with the twelfth apostle, is called episkopon in the Greek. Episkopon. What is episkopon? Bishop. To my mind, all the early church testimonies tell us about an election of James right after the ascension of our Savior, as they put it, to bishop of the early church. It's missing from the book of Acts. This is what I think has happened. The explanation of the death, odd as it may seem, of Judas is, and the filling of a twelfth apostle who's never heard from again is substituted for the election episode regarding James at the beginning of the book of Acts. And the verse episcopon is the key upon which to um, uh, hang that. Judas never was an, a bishop. Now, again, it's very important to look at the um, to look at the two Psalms texts that are mentioned there. Um, they don't read exactly in the way they are written here. Um, what are the two Psalm texts? I don't have a Bible with me, so I can't read them to you. But if someone can open those patches and read it to us while I keep going here, it would probably um, um, be helpful. In any case, if you see the end of Acts 26, and they drew lots, Judas fell away. 
and then a lot went to Matthias. He was counted with the, as if there have to be twelve apostles all the time. But who is Matthias? I mean, we've already got a Matthew. So what happened to Matthias? Is he? What's the significance of him? None, except to fill out the twelve man apostle scheme in the mind of the writer of Acts. You say, well, what are you trying to say? The important election of James is totally missing. And yet when James is in, in, introduced somewhere in the middle of Acts, it looks like we're supposed to know who he is. So I put all these together, and what I do say, in my view of things, yes, there was a passage from Jeremiah that's manhandled, as you see in Matthew, since it's not Jeremiah, it's Zechariah. <coughs> I know you have to It's manhandled in Matthew. There was a passage from Jeremiah because... Je Jeremiah tells us who the Rechabites were. And I think that passage was used to introduce James, who is an archetypical Rechabite sort of person. You say, well, who are the Rechabites? In the testimony of the um, death of James in Eusebius, attributed to Hegesippus, Eusebius is in the 4th century, Hegesippus in, in the 2nd. Hegesippus is no longer existent, but Eusebius... Uh, excerpts a lot of words. He has the witness to the stoning of James, just like Paul is the witness to the stoning of Stephen in Acts. He calls that one of the priests of the Rechabites. And another text identifies that as Simeon Barcleophus, Jesus' first cousin, James' first cousin, or James and Jesus' second brother. So he said, what have you done here? Well, I've juggled all these things in the air, and I've come up that the Rechabites have something to do with this family of uh, priest, um, uh, priest kings, or whatever they are. The Rechabites are known in the Old Testament. They don't drink wine. They don't cultivate. Uh, you know, they wear linen clothes, stuff like all that we say about James. They don't um, cut their hair, things like that. Um, you have to read about the Rechabites in Jeremiah 35. It's in Jeremiah 35. So I say that, yeah, Jeremiah did have something to do with all this. And as they substituted this material about Judas in here, they dropped the material about James and the Rechabites. Now that may or may not be true, but that's uh, something that I, I have a uh, worry. Now, did you find those passages? Mm -hmm. What psalm is the first passage from? Um, I don't know. My book says that it's well, that's what I mean. Read what you 695 says. Because this is all, anyway, this is double translation here. But go ahead. It's, uh, God, we know how foolish I am. My offenses are not the end for you. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. The second one is 1098. Uh, what a... Uh, let me see that. Let me see that. Let me see that. Let me just see 65. Can I? Keep your... 65. 65 or 69? 69.5. Yay. See here. I'm meeting up with zeal for your house. 69.9. So a lot of things have come out uh, of this that have been picked up into the New Testament. Uh, save me. I am sinking. It's a lot of um, being saved and the zeal bearing insults, and so on and so forth. But now look at line 35. For God will save Zion, and rebuild the cities of Judah, and people will live there on their own land, and the descendants of his servants will inherit, and those who love his name will dwell there. This is totally Zionistic poem. And yet pieces are taken out and applied to this material. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't be anti-Zionist if you want to call it that. Taking the message out to the cosmopolitan area, basing it on one line in the psalm, and taking it out of a totally Zionistic psalm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> 69.25 is what mine says. And it's yeah, reduce their encampment to ruin and leave their tents. Thank you very much. You will vent your fury on them, let your burning anger overtake them. There's the, the Kas Hamato from the uh, Habakkuk commentary. Re, uh, burning anger is Kas Hamato. Reduce the encampment to ruin and leave their tents un, untenanted. Here, it's changed to a singular, changed to a singular. So there's liberties, uh, there's a lot of liberties uh, taken with the passage, as you see. Um, 
and there will be no one living in it. That's not what it's uh, talking about. It's, it wants this to happen. Anyway, what I'm saying is they take great liberties with the biblical text to play into the scenario that they're doing here. Now, the other one is um, Psalm what? And I want you to know, always, that's why you should always read the whole psalm. Just don't read the passage. You find it from my life. I'm going to keep hurrying. I'm a blank today. So that's important. Now, whenever you see a biblical passage, go look it up. Look at the context of it. See if it actually agrees with the sense of the biblical passage that you're, that's been quoted. Don't just say, oh, yeah, uh, yeah that's right. Look at that. That's, uh, that's a, that's a nice proof text there. No, it isn't. Would not, it's not totally legitimate proof text. And it's being used with the total opposite purposes of the original psalm. Now, I don't accept that as a, a legitimate way to use scripture. You may. Yeah, go ahead. One and nine. One and nine. Okay, a God, friendship. They have pin me a set of a wicked man, and his trauma be emerged as guilty. May his life be cut short, someone else take over his office. This, this is pretty straightforward. Um, notice at the end, though, help me, Yahweh, my God. <coughs> Yahweh pays back the accusers who blacken my name. Um, thanks to Yahweh on my lips, I praise him, for he stands at the side of the poor. Here's the Ebionite. This is an Ebionite song. To save the lives from those who sit in judgment on them. This is made, I think, referred to, if you know Psalm 37, Pesher, there's actually a passage in the Psalm 37, Pesher, from Qumran about saving the poor from those who sit in judgment upon them. Similar material there. So I'd always like, you know, juggle all these things together and look at the tenor of the thing and see if it sounds like the tenor it's being looked to. Let another take his office. Well, that's very convenient to go through the whole of Scripture and find something in a psalm that says, uh, let someone succeed him. And that's, just, that's, that's, just not, um, that's just not a legitimate way to use Scripture to my mind. In any case, um, <coughs> all that has to do with the death of Judas is scary. Now, let's see. So now, can you find the Zechariah passage? What is this? Matthew 27. What is it? Matthew 27. Uh, 5. Matthew, I think I even have it here. Uh, I don't have the Zechariah passage that this actually is related to, but you'll find that that's been. It says Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. Yeah. Yeah, if you can find that passage, we can look at it and compare it if you want. So it's not Jeremiah. We all agree on that, right? <laughs> so that's, so this is not the word of God here. Why? Because God doesn't make mistakes, to my mind. Oh, you said that's a copyist error. Okay, that may be. But uh, that's the only way out of that particular issue that you're going to have to have. Uh, most of this now is has to do with um, material from different psalms. The death scenario, I think, is mostly uh, from that material. Did you find that? Excuse me, what was that? Zechariah 11, 1? 12 through 13. Why Zechariah? Okay, okay, Zechariah. I took my staff, goodwill, and broke it in half to, uh, to break my covenant, which I made with all the peoples when it was broken in the day. The sheep dealers were watching. I put the Hebrew here. Watching me, realizing that this had been a word of Yahweh, I then said to them, If you see fit, give me my wages. If not, never mind. So they weighed out my wages, 30 shekels of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the silversmith, this princely sum at which they have valued me. Taking the thirty shekels of silver, I threw it to them in the temple of Yahweh, for the smelter then broke my... I have no idea what this means, or anything from that translation, but <laughs> it's pretty garbled in terms of what we have here anyway. So let's come finish with Judas Iscariot. Um, he's definitely presented as pretty de uh, demonical. 
Um, there is a very interesting Talmudic material relating to Jesus the Nazarene, the only passage ever see that in the Middle Ages the Talmud was um, What do you do when you uh, censor some? Yeah, censors. And all passages were crossed out that may or may not have related to Jesus, which wouldn't have been very positive. But I don't think we would have gotten a lot of good material from that. Because the Talmud, by that time, <coughs> accepted the Christian presentation. And so on. the Talmud was written from the 1st to the 6th century AD. But one, I think, authentic uh, tradition about Jesus may have. Um, not through. I make a lot of it in my book, both books. It's called, um, it's attributed to one Jacob of Clarsacania. And, uh, or Jacob of Signine, which of course is a James name. And it says, can you, and he met this famous rabbinic teacher called Eliezer Ben Myrconis, who was excommunicated for being sympathetic to what was called Minim, or sectarians or people that the Christian type, original, uh, early Christian peoples in Palestine were the thought of being. And Eliezer ben Hyrcanus, so it's a, it's a tradition ascribed to Eliezer ben Hyrcanus. I also make a lot of him in my recent book. Um, speaking about Eliezer's bad breath and Lazarus' stinking body. I think Lazarus and Eliezer swing back and forth as far as the na uh, na names go. In any case, um, <coughs> Eliezer meets Jacob and says, can you tell me something about Jesus the Nazarene? So Jacob is supposed to know something about Jesus the Nazarene. And he says, yeah, I can tell you something about a prostitute's heart. Jesus and a prostitute's heart. What did Jesus think should be done with a prostitute's hire given to the temple. And I think this relates somewhat to this passage here. It has some of the same themes. Could be considered the price of blood or whatever, you know, menstrual situations, whatever. And uh, he said, yes, he said, you should use it to build an outhouse for the high priests. And I, I think that's a pretty funny uh, little episode uh, showing Jesus to have a good sense of humor. In other words, what should you do with the prostitute's hire given to the temple? You should use it to build an outhouse for the high priest. I think that's a very, I, I said, do you think that's an authentic saying of uh, Jesus? Well, as authentic as any of these, I would imagine. And then uh, this is what one has to evaluate on what looks like it may have been said by someone. Anyway, it shows the individual in question to have a very cute sense of humor and to be anti-establishment, which I uh, which I accept uh, in both uh, in both those things. All right, we got to hurry. So um, this is Judas's hire being given to the temple. You see, it's very similar, but played off of in a different way. Luke twenty-three one two. The appearance before Pilate. We found this man perverting our nation and forbidding them to pay tribute to Caesar and calling himself Christ a king. Okay, calling himself a king, that could be, not calling himself son of God, Christ. And it could be have here Messiah, son of God. Now, perverting our nation, here Jesus is portrayed as... Um, teaching against the temple tax. Now there are passages in the scripture, we haven't had a chance to, to, to deal with them all, where Jesus um, says, okay, what should we, shall we pay tax? And he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and God's what is God's, he who has ears let him hear. Those are a uh, popular passage in the synoptics, I think. And another case, a temple tax, they say, or something to that effect, he says, show me the coin and then, or Whose picture, that was the, that much, whose picture is on the coin and rendering to Caesar what is Caesar and so on. Another one has to do with go to the Sea of Galilee and uh, you'll find um, a fish there that will come out of the sea and it'll have the, the coin in its mouth. You can use that coin or something like that. I forget exactly that whole passage, but there are two passages like that. 
<coughs> both of them show a Jesus that is rather worried about the issue. This shows a Jesus on the Zealot side. We know that's what the Zealots were upset about. Um, further, I've told you about the whole Sakari thing here. And the fact of similar enemies. Now, Christian, I know it's a, I know it's a long shot, but it's something to consider. Because these things go through lots of different languages. You see, there's a lot of Scrabble type situations here going on, you see. Uh, and if you get it to Sicario, you can get even more of that going on. You know, it's a, uh, there's a possible play going on here. Um, Sicari being a, a nasty way of speaking about Christian or something like that. You see, Judas the Iscariot, Judas the Sicari, Judas the Christian. Um, I know it's, it's just something to think about. There's a lot of problems with the Sicari in North Africa. Josephus tells about them in the Vita in Egypt. And they have to put down uprisings after the fall of the temple in these other places the Romans do. And they destroy a second Jewish temple in Egypt because the Sicari went down there and took refuge in it. So the Sicari were, were certainly a, a problem for 10, 20, 30 years after, probably even in, up to the Bar Kokhba period because of the Sakara Khan that I mentioned before, which was uh, applied very stringently after the Bar Kokhba uprising. And it was uh, directed against people who had been involved in these wars. I also told you that Sicarius can mean, in Roman uh, legal jargon, someone who mutilated himself or circumcised himself or circumcised others. There's a lot of give here going on in this issue. Uh, James's party, the party of the circumcision, demanding, I'm not saying circumcision is a marvelous thing or anything, only that it's the sign of the, of the uh, uh, you know, um, attachment to the covenant. I think these are covenantal groups. And how are you going to show your attachment to a covenant? You just can't be a Pentecostal to show it, um, or something like that. You have to have some overt sign of it that you are, you know, Jehovah's Witness of some kind. You have to you have to do something in, in this period, maybe not today. So circumcision loomed very large back then, as it did among the Nazis in our time, looking for anyone who showed any sign of that to kill them all. Um, so the Sakari is, uh, is an odd thing, because these groups, as I've told you before, would not have called themselves Sakari. You don't call yourself cutthroat. <laughs> That's a term others apply to you. You have an internal name. What was your internal name? Well, Essie, Hasid, uh, Zelot, um, Ebenite, um, something to do with Christian, but not Christian, because that's a Greek term, Messianist, Nothrim, Keepers, keepers, not serene, Nazarene, not serene means keepers. I don't know what the internal name was. To keep the covenant. Um, to my mind, probably the best is Nazarite. movement of perfect Nazarites. That's what the scrolls are. Perfect holy ones. Consecrated ones. Anyway, <coughs> I don't know, but their enemies would have called them Sicari if they were involved in what they considered to be murderous activities. Bin Laden's group, I'm sure, doesn't call itself thugs, murderers, assassins, terrorists. Um, they call themselves maybe jihadists, which is holy war practitioners or some other names like that, you know? So, um, you know, you have to separate these things out again. Let's go on. So did Jesus forbid the tribute? Well, if you're a zealot, 
Everything belongs to God, nothing belongs to Caesar. So you can hear that in a double way. Tolstoy, in his famous works, went around the Christian world as he knew it in that day. He was excommunicated by the Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church. He was saying, you know, I'm looking for a Christian, sort of like God, and he's looking for an honest, honest man. He wanted to know when the, um, when the uh, stricture turning the other cheek or um, not to fight and so on and so forth was bypassed. And how come Christian priests in his day blessed armies? And he went around looking and talking to people and they all said, oh, that was solved long ago, that was solved long ago. We already dealt with that issue. But as far as he could look, he says in some of his writings, he never could find when this issue was ever regulated and why it's considered, uh, um, you know, in Russia and other places at that time, um, all right to do. Many of these things are the same. You know, people say, oh, that was, that was sorted out one time. No, it was never sorted out. It was never sorted out. Uh, none of these things have ever been sorted out. Okay, let's get moving here. Um, so the, the um, Pilate usually wasn't up in Jerusalem anyway. He was usually down in Caesarea. Maybe he came up for some administrative purposes. He asks him, line 11 of Matthew, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus, Jesus is wise guy here. You have said it. You can't talk to a governor like that without being bashed in the mouth probably. Here there may be some bashing going around on, but it's not portrayed that way because this is basically pro-Roman presentation. Pilate is presented as fairly good. The high priests are presented because they're supposed to be Jews as fairly bad. Uh, I wouldn't accept either of the presentations. But if anyone would be bashing people in the mouth, it would be Pilate because he's known for extreme brutality. Instead, the governor marveled greatly at some of the things Jesus said, line 13, Matthew. Mark 15, 5 echoes that. Now on the other hand, for John 18, 35, uh, Jesus is very loquacious, can hardly keep him quiet. Here one thing he doesn't speak like Socrates. In John, he explained things. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, I would let my servants fight. That I should not be delivered to the Jews. There John gives his orientation again. This is certainly Alexandrian Greek. It would, I mean, Jesus wouldn't say, I would not be delivered to the Americans. You know, and so on. <coughs> just, just turn it around and see how you would receive that from one of your heroes. Martin Luther King, I would not be delivered to the Americans. I don't think that's, uh, that can be considered Palestinian. There was another uh, section that I missed somewhere, and um, I don't know where, uh, where it is. Uh, but um, at one point, Jesus is asked earlier on, and I think it's Luke, could be John, or uh, could be Mark even, but one of those three, not Matthew. Um, He's being questioned as to why he's the Messiah, and then the crowd says, we thought the Messiah had to come from Bethlehem in Judea. And so the crowd doesn't know that Jesus is born in Bethlehem in that particular gospel. That's another interesting little exchange to try to uh, weigh when you're dealing with the struggle of Jesus. Why doesn't the crowd in that particular gospel know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Okay. So if we look here now, um, John, art thou the king of the Jews? Here Matthew agrees with him, and so does Mark and the other synoptics. Um, in Luke 23:4, Pilate says, "I find no fault in this man." Arguing with it was the chief priests now who are the guilty ones. Pilate, the most brutal governor who executed. Um, the Taheb in Samaria, who 
who uh, put his thugs uh, among the crowd when they begged him not to bring the standards into Jerusalem and out a single club the whole crowd to death when they were on their knees asking him and Josephus to, uh, to uh, please not do that. And um, Pilate, who Philo says in his mission to Gaius, was removed because he was the most brutal governor in Palestine. And that rarely happens to any of the governors. Here, Pilate marvels about Jesus and finds no fault in the man. Um, but now, the, the, now the, it's the priests who are worked up. Why would the priests be all worked up? He stirred the people teaching throughout Judea and Galilee, even out of this place. And uh, talking about being a Galilean, Luke 6, 23, 6. <coughs> so now Luke, the know-it-all, has an intervening interview now, because he knows, he's read as Josephus, that Galilee was Herod Antipas's tetrarchy. So now he has an intervening interview by uh, the, the Herodian, this one responsible for the death of John the Baptist. He calls him Herod, but it's uh, Herod Antipas. He sends for him, very clever, because he knows that... Uh, it, but also, uh, Perea, I'll keep you in the quarter up. Also, uh, would you pass around that roll thing? I don't have the, I can't get my hand on it. Can you can rip out a piece of paper for all the good people who are here. Who's got a piece of paper? Oh, you got one. Good. Put the date on. Thanks. So, um, I was late five. I'm trying to make up for it. I apologize. So, um, he knows that uh, this Antipas was the. Uh, governor in um, Perea and in uh, Galilee. So he says, well, it's his jurisdiction, bring him in. That makes it more realistic than the other Gospels. Luke has clearly been reading Josephus. But once again, this is the same man responsible for the death of John the Baptist. That we know from Josephus. And by the way, if, uh, if you feel that Pilate, uh, you want Pilate, and there's a, yeah, there were even later there was even a gospel written in the name of Pontius Pilate. If you want Pilate as a Christian, well, you're welcome to him. You're welcome to him, that's all I can say. And uh, so this, is, uh, this is really, I don't think it's very, very reliable. It's uh, uh, playing up to the Roman audience, showing that the governor really uh, doesn't see him guilty, but the scribes are vehemently accusing him, just like they accused within the Jerusalem church that Pharisees or the law people accused Paul. <coughs> and um, at this moment, I mean, come on, this is ridiculous here, line 12. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day because before there was enmity between No, no, come on. No, sorry. I don't, uh, I don't see the basis for it. I don't. Think, I can't imagine it. Uh, they probably knew each other a long time, and they get friends, become friends because of Jesus. No, I don't think so. This is not the way these men behave. So then Pilate said, "You brought this man uh, as one who perverted line 13, the whole people, and so on and so forth." And Herod didn't even find these things. Great, good Herod, who only kills anyone he wants to, like John the Baptist. And he sent him behalf. So I don't find anything wrong with him. So I will release him. So again, Mel Gibson style, the crowd yells out the following things in Matthew 27, 15, Mark 15, 6. So Barabbas, whoever he is, had committed, uh, he's called Jesus Barabbas in some texts. So he's quoted kind of like a double of Jesus, Matthew 27, 15, Mark 15, 6. He had been involved in an insurrection of some kind. Here, Matthew 27, 17, he's called Jesus Barabbas. I think. No, I'm not sure. That's Jesus who's called the Christ. But anyway, in, in some of the texts, I don't have it in front of me, which one. And so again, um, Pilate, here's another story that appeals to Roman audiences, I'm sure. Pilate has a nice wife um, who has a dream. And he says, 
have nothing to do with this righteous man. Pilate is uh, this brutal sort of person, a thuggish governor of uh, Palestine. I'm going to listen to his wife now. So I think you say, well, who, why would these things be in here? Well, I told you that uh, we're doing with scenarios here. People creating the material, uh, what they thought happened. And you have to evaluate if it's uh, true or not. I'm right? looking for the historical Jesus here. And personally, this sounds to me like some people up in Hollywood would do with something who have, um, you know, want to spin it in this other fashion here. You say, no, Professor Eisenhower, you're just trying to escape. You judge that. You're the judge. You decide. I can't, you know, prove it one way or the other. Anyway, Barabbas was a revolutionary had created murder. So finally, we get this whole thing, the crowd cries out, 27, it's very familiar for 23. <coughs> Let him be crucified. So Pilate was again afraid, just like Herod was with John the Baptist, because a, a woman did a dance uh, sexually, and he promised his head, even though John... He thought he was a righteous man. Notice they all recognize John the Baptist and Jesus as righteous men. <coughs> the Roman governors and Herodian kings see these people as righteous ones, whereas the crowd of the Jews are horrid, horrible people. And he's, they, they take a murderer instead of Christ. I think this is written by Greeks, frankly, and others. And then they cry out, his blood be on us, the famous passage in line 25, which was used in Poland to burn people inside synagogues and other places, hurting whole towns into barns and things, and then setting fire to them, including little children, to justify all this sort of thing. And it's very effective. And all the people answer, his blood be on us and our children. And they, deliver, they release the murderer, uh, who had created murder, another interesting little episode, we'll never hear from about <coughs> Barabbas again, though he's a very popular uh, character in folklore. So, um, then the soldiers take Jesus, oh, they scourge and deliver him to be crucified. I'm sure Mel Gibson had a lot of fun with that scourging and stuff in his movie. Um, so, uh, then 27, they took Jesus to the palace, stripped him, put a scarlet robe, put a crown of thorns on his head, and then they started mocking him, hail king of the Jews. Well, one thing is true. If someone, Jesus or anyone else, presented himself as the local ruler without Roman appointment, that would be considered an insurrectionary act, probably worthy of crucifixion if he wasn't a Roman citizen. The Romans did not crucify Roman citizens. Paul, theoretically, although the tradition has him crucified, and finally uh, would not ever be crucified because he keeps pulling out his Roman passport. Anyway, uh, so they mock him, hail king of the Jews. And here the soldiers maybe are portrayed a little uh, accurately in terms of their brutality. John has, uh, John 19.4, has Pilate saying, I find no crime in him. But the priests cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Why they want him crucified, I have no idea. We have a law because he made himself the son of God. I think this is retrospective. This is John 19, 7. Because I don't think the son of God ideology had been applied to Jesus at this point. So the people writing this know that Jews don't, uh, uh, don't uh, agree that anyone is the son of God, only symbolically speaking and so on. So the crowd again argues with Pilate in John 19. Um, and so Pilate again is shown as weak and spineless. You're supposed to be Caesar's friend, line 12. Here's a man who's making himself king. We don't like him. The whole world likes him, but we don't like him. And so um, when Pilate heard these words, line 12, he brought Jesus out and sat on the judgment seat. 
and the Jews are still crying out, crucify him, crucify him, and he delivered him unto them to be crucified. So he gives him to the crowd. Well, crucifixion is forbidden among Jews. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls condemn it visa violently. They say anyone who is, gets a person done to death by the law of the foreigners shall himself be put to death. It's in the scrolls. Um, in any case, hanging a man up on a tree in the Nahum Pesher is commented on. Something that the furious young lion does is supposed to be an earlier Maccabean king. And uh, the scrolls condemn that. They don't mind the king, but they don't like what he did. And they said, a thing never formally done in Israel. A thing not formally ever done in Israel. Okay, I'm going to let you go. I think we will be able to finish this now next time. I'm sorry to have uh, gotten so bogged down. We'll talk about the test. We'll do the crucifixion, the witnesses, and the witnesses to the resurrection, and we should have it all wrapped up, and you are then the judges. And I am just one of the uh, lawyers in the courtroom. You're the O.J. Simpson jury. Yes, well, <laughs> Question. I heard the more <laughs> Well, there's another guy coming up who wants to take it early. Well, that may be a different class. I get confused.